ECDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to ECDC On Air, the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. I'm your host, Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. Today, we are joined again by Connie Adeloch, Principal Expert in Coronaviruses and Influenza here at ECDC. We will be discussing the current avian influenza outbreak and the newly published report on it, written jointly with EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, and the European Union Reference Laboratories. We will be discussing how this outbreak has spread, what makes it unique, and what we can do to protect ourselves. So today we are joined by Connie Adelhoch, Principal Expert for Coronavirus and Influenza here at ECDC. Connie, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. ECDC, along with the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, and the European Union Reference Laboratories, uh, EURL, have put together an overview of the current avian influenza outbreak that is ongoing. What is new or particular about this current outbreak? Is it just one strain or is it similar to the flu in people where we see different strains? So what we have been seeing over the last three years, we have ongoing avian influenza outbreaks in wild birds, but also then spillovers to poultry. And what we have seen over the last years is an expansion of the geographical area that has been affected and where detections have been made in Europe, up to Svalbard, to Iceland, for example. But what we have also seen last year, that we have a a spillover into the, the Americas, affecting Canada and the U.S., And now also during the autumn migration, what we have never seen and observed before, that also avian influenza via the migratory bird routes has entered South America and causing a lot of mortality in the wild bird population there because it's also a susceptible population which has never been affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza before. Okay, so before we begin talking about the spread outside of Europe, uh, so what type of birds have mainly been affected by the virus in Europe? Do we know why some birds are more susceptible than others? The avian influenza is associated a lot with migratory waterfowl, which do not really get sick. So they are able to transport the virus over long distances and then introducing it into local bird populations. What we have seen, a change in the affected bird populations over time. So we had gulls and swans last year and um, other um, water birds. During the last year's summer, we have observed a large introduction into colony breeding seabirds, which affect them heavily. And we have seen mass mortality events in these colonies. And these outbreaks are ongoing. And we are seeing now also a bit of a different shift into the affected species of these colony breeding birds, but also um, among the water birds. But what we are also seeing, and these are our indicators, that not only those species are affected, we are seeing um, predator birds and raptors who are falling sick and which are the indicators that other local bird species are also sick. Okay, so the report has said that the virus has persisted in Europe in residential wild birds uh, during and after the summer months. Why is this unusual? What we have known in the past was that avian influenza was entered uh, through the autumn migration, where we had the bird migration into Europe. Then we had we faced outbreaks, spillovers to the poultry farms, outbreaks in the poultry farms, and then over the winter period, and then slightly decreasing in the spring. And then with the spring migration, we have not then had um, continuous outbreaks during the summer. So it kind of disappeared during the summer period. But then over the last three years, We have observed that also, like Norway has never been experienced any avian influenza outbreak before, but now with the bird migration into their summer breeding sites, this virus has also been brought into northern European areas and it remained there also. So what, and it continues also there. So this is very unusual. And what I said also with the colony breeding birds, they have never been affected and they are also in Central Europe, not only in in Northern Europe. So there is a danger that this could become endemic to Europe, across Europe. 
We have also seen, looking at the virological data, um, usually then during the autumn migration, we see a new introduction of different avian influenza viruses into Europe via the where these migratory birds bring in new genotypes into it, which have a different gene constellation. But this year was the first winter where we have not seen an introduction of new viruses, but a, a, a circulation and a continued circulation of viruses that also um, have caused outbreak and, and wild bird mortality during the summer. So this kind of continued in the residential bird population. We're going to be talking a little bit about spillover events and how they can occur. So what are the risk factors that would likely increase this and how do public health authorities respond to this? So spillover events can be manifold. We have the spillover event between different species among, for example, bird species, but also from bird to mammal species and then from mammal to humans or from birds to humans. They have a different shape also and are related to the exposure to, to the infected animal. And usually when people are exposed to infected animals, for example, during culling activities, there is some passive or active monitoring of this person if they develop symptoms and then testing is in place to really identify an infection in, in a human as early as possible. And obviously with spillovers to other mammalian species, there is also the potential for spillover to humans. Have there been any reported cases in humans in Europe? We have seen spillovers um, in Ecuador with a um, very severely ill girl exposed to backyard poultry that was sick and dead and also confirmed then with, with avian influenza. Uh, we have seen spillover events to humans with also severe disease in China and also in Cambodia, which was due to a local circulating uh, virus clade there. We have seen some detections in people being directly involved in culling activities. So when you have an outbreak in the poultry farms, as a prevention measure and control measure, all of the affected birds in these farms are culled. So we have specific teams who go into these farms to do this culling and this cleaning activities. And they are well trained to wear personal protective equipment, all of the measures that are um, necessary to prevent any transmission to humans. And of course, if you imagine such environment, you also have a, a large uh, contamination with viral particles. So we have detections in Spain in workers exposed to these environments and involved in these culling activities, but were protected. And the authorities were testing those people and there was a very faint positive PCR. So there is a PCR signal, but the authorities also did a lot of work around um, testing. Also, there is no zero reaction visible in these people so that the authorities um, are confident that these were just contaminations and not real infection. So in Europe, we have not seen infection yet, luckily. Based on that, what is the assessed risk of infection with the virus in Europe? I would imagine it's quite low still. We have seen massive outbreaks and mortality both in wild birds and in the poultry sector. So we are considering a large number of exposures between humans and potentially infected birds. While we know that in the poultry sector, all of these workers who do the job are well protected and well trained. But we have also, of course, uh, seen exposure when, you know, birds are found on the beaches lying dead. And we have not seen any transmission events yet. So for the European viruses, also looking at the, at the viral data, we, we know that these viruses are avian-like. So they do not per se transmit to human as they are not really fit to adapt to the human receptors, they are susceptible to antivirus. So we have a measure in case there is a transmission. And so our risk also for the general population, because the exposure to infected and dead birds, um, also wild birds, is not uh, really very frequent and not re really high. We consider the risk for the general population to be low. Of course, those which are directly exposed to these birds um, with avian influenza, the risk is higher and we consider this as low to, to medium or low to moderate. Nevertheless, where we know that avian influenza is present in Europe, also human infections might be possible. So we cannot rule out that such infections will not happen in the future, as we have seen this also now in Ecuador and also in Asian countries. Okay, so you have mentioned a few times that the virus has spread to North America and South America now, which is new, 
and also in parts of Asia as well. Are there other mammalian species that are in danger of catching avian flu? What are the mammal species that are especially prone to infection? We have seen a lot of carnivore mammals at the moment that have been foraging or feeding on sick and dead birds and therefore have been directly exposed and ingesting infected bird meat. But we also know, for example, from other before studies that ferret are the, the gold standard for studying influenza viruses and the transmission of influenza for seasonal influenza virus, but also for avian influenza viruses. And ferret are also closely related to mink, where we have also seen transmission events to mink in the nature, but also in mink farming. We know that swine are the mixing vessel, also from 2009 experience in the pandemic, uh, which are susceptible both to seasonal influenza viruses, but also to avian influenza viruses, and also have their own swine-specific influenza viruses. Seals are one of the species that has been also shown that there have been transmission events from avian influenza into the seal population and also seal-to-seal -seal transmission events. And this is also what we are seeing now in Chile with seal and sea lion transmission events that are also associated with mortality events. How does avian influenza infection in humans differ from regular seasonal flu? And why is it much more deadly? Well, the original symptoms do not really differ very much from seasonal influenza viruses. So we see respiratory symptoms like cough, like fever, running nose, but also conjunctivitis. We, have, we see a lot of pneumonia cases. And then when it becomes really severe, organ failure and then also death. What we have also seen in mammal species now during these uh, recent avian influenza epidemics, uh, that mammals develop neurological symptoms. And they have also developed encephalitis and, and therefore it's also crucial to consider such severe symptoms, which are usually unspecific for influenza, also in humans to be tested for avian influenza in case this person was uh, exposed to a potentially infected animal before. Is it possible for spillover events to contribute to the emergence of new strains of influenza? These spillover events, what we are seeing now uh, to the mammalian species, already triggers that we see mutations in one of the genes, in the PB2 gene, and that is related to increased replication in mammalian species. So we see already some adaptation mechanisms in the virus when these mammalian species are infected. And not only kind of mutations within the genome can happen, in some which are related to the replication, but then also to the receptor binding, of course, which are much more important then. We also can have reassortant events between different influenza viruses coming from different species. For example, we know for the 2009 that the swine played a, a very crucial role in the emergence of the pandemic. And that swine is also a susceptible species for influenza viruses per se. So this could happen that uh, viruses from birds like avian influenza viruses also can reassort with, with swine flu in the swine population. But we can also have a reassortment events between seasonal human influenza viruses and avian influenza viruses. So a lot of different scenarios are possible, but not sure how many of these scenarios are really realistic. What are some of the key strategies for preventing the spread of avian flu and reducing its risk to people? Of course, the individual is responsible for their, their own protection when knowing that the, the, the being exposed to such birds and now also, of course, to infected or potentially infected mammals when, when found dead. The public health guidance is very clear to use personal protective equipment, but we have also measures like antivirus, which, which could be used as a pre- or post-exposure prophylaxis. We have also, of course, the seasonal influenza vaccines that are available to prevent what I also refer to with the reassortment events or at least uh, reduce the, the likelihood to have this because then you reduce the chance also to be infected with seasonal influenza viruses. How infectious or deadly could avian flu be if we were to see ongoing human-to-human -human transmission? I think it's a long way to, to have such a scenario and I'm not sure we we have seen in avian influenza circulating in birds globally um, since 2004. So we have observed 
this large situation. And we have also observed this high level of outbreaks in Europe, in the wild bird, in the poultry industry with exposure. We have not seen so far really a trigger that the viruses would become more likely to really transmit directly to humans and then also between humans. Nevertheless, the whole community on the animal health side, but also on the public health side, we are very well aware and we are very cautious about the situation that data are shared as soon as possible, sequence data are shared for updated risk assessments, and then also that those people who are exposed to avian uh, influenza are monitored and in case people are experiencing symptoms or sometimes are also in, in routinely are tested that we can really rule out any infection and very important to identify the first uh, human to human um, transmission. With so many new cases and the non-seasonal spread seen around the world, is this some kind of milestone moment or do we simply see a more full picture thanks to improved monitoring and surveillance, which we could say is as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? What we are seeing is an exceptional situation, particularly on the on the bird side, um, with the introduction into several unaffected uh, regions globally. So this is, of course, remarkable. What is also remarkable is that we see so many transmission events to different mammalian species and also transmission events with mortality associated in some mammalian species. This is absolutely something which needs attention and which also needs um, some careful work on the public health side to also be ready whenever there is some transmission to humans. Nevertheless, we have the instruments. We have the vaccine candidate viruses for pandemic preparedness are already evaluated or are constantly evaluated at least twice a year by the WHO and updated if necessary, also if the fit well to the currently circulating viruses and updated if, if not. So there is something already in the pipeline. We have the antivirus as set as a, as a tool available which work against influenza and prevent severe disease and, and fatal disease. We have been well trained over the last three years what a pandemic really means. So I think nobody of us wants to see such a situation in the future again. So we have also done a lot of homework also to improve the surveillance systems in Europe. The countries have, have done a lot of improvement in looking into the respiratory surveillance and monitoring tools to improve the systems as such, also improve their hospital surveillance systems, their overall hospital capacities. And we have seen how quickly this could be implemented and also in upscale and downscale. So I think there is a lot of on different levels work that is also ongoing behind the scenes to have the preparedness side on the vaccines, on any other countermeasures in place, and to have also the testing and the reporting systems follow up in place. So for the moment, we don't need to worry about another pandemic. What we see at the moment, human infections are really rare events. We see very few infections in humans each and every year. So there are so far no indications that that we see more transmissions also recently. But what we see are transmission events to mammalian species, which are of concern and which need to be followed up. However, dealing with influenza viruses, we know that there is always this pandemic risk and that viruses have a lot of um, opportunities to evolve and to emerge. What we have also seen with SARS-CoV-2 over the last three years, how different variants have been emerging. And this the same, if you give the opportunity to influenza virus in the same way as we have been seeing it now also in the bird population, we see a, a large diversification of the viruses. So it's also important to follow up the situation and to do a constant update of the risk assessment. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time, Connie. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <music> If you would like to know more about the current avian influenza outbreak and want to read ECDC's joint report with EFSA and the European Union Reference Laboratories, you can find links in the notes of this episode. EFSA will also release a podcast on this topic. A link to that will also be in the notes. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for a topic you would like us to cover, you can leave them in the comments section of this video or on the social media platform of your choice. For more information about ECDC, please visit us at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.